Hi, everybody. I'm Alexandre Michy, cardiologist in Montluçon, France. Uh, I'm the chair of the uh, working group in cardiology from the ASFTH. The ASFTH uh, is an international organization that counts around 40,000 members worldwide um, and is focused on telemedicine. Uh, so I have the huge honor to, tonight, uh, today, uh, to um, uh, have uh, um, uh, very important invites and uh, beautiful people to our webinar and I have the huge pleasure to uh, present to you and to see once again uh, my co-host Dr. Professor Annabel santos volman Professor of Medicine uh, at Rush College of Medicine and uh, uh, the immediate past chair of the American Heart Association Women in Cardiology. Annabel, thank you so much for uh, taking the time and thank, thank you to all, thank, thanks to all the um, um, persons who participate to the webinar. Uh, you have uh, the word. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Alex. It's uh, my pleasure to, to be here. And uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speakers uh, for this webinar. We had the pleasure of having um, hosted in Chicago, the American Heart Association Scientific Sessions 2022. And uh, it was really wonderful to be back uh, live in person. It was lots of hugs and kisses and uh, lots of dinners and it was a lot of fun. So thank you all for, for joining us. I'm going to introduce the four speakers and then Alex will introduce the last speaker on hypertension. So with us uh, today um, is Dr. Andrea Russo, who is the Director of, of Electrophysiology and Arrhythmia Services at and Director of Research at Cooper Cooper Heart Institute. She is also the program director of the Clinical Cardiac Electrophysiology Fellowship and a past president of the Heart Rhythm Society. Um, Dr. Roxana Moran um, will be presenting the ischemia trials, and she is the director of interventional cardiovascular research and clinical trials at the Zena and Michael Wiener Cardiovascular Institute at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. She's also a professor of medicine and the co-founder of Women as One. We have Dr. Mohammed Khan, who is presenting um, heart failure trials, and he is a cardiovascular disease fellow at Duke University. And last but not least of the four Americans is Dr. Allison Hayes, who is a general cardiologist and medical director of echocardiography programs at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. She's an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. So we're going to start with Dr. Andrea Russo. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alex and Annabelle for inviting me today. It was actually, I agree, great to be in person and uh, certainly, uh, it was a great meeting and, and nice to, to see everyone. So I'm going to talk, go very quickly through three of the, the major arrhythmia studies or three of the studies that were presented um, at the meeting. The, the first one uh, I'll talk about is, is a study that uh, Jason Andrade presented on progression of AFib after a cryoablation or drug therapy. So we know, and there's more and more talk lately about the progression of AF and trying to treat atrial fibrillation earlier before we start to get a lot of atrial remodeling. And, and in other studies have shown worse outcomes, uh, clinical outcomes in, in patients who have had a more progressive disease and more when AFib becomes more persistent. So this particular study looked at a, a primary endpoint of the time to the first occurrence of any episode of, of persistent atrial arrhythmia, including fibrillation was the majority of, or flutter or an atrial tachycardia that lasted at least seven days in duration um, uh, or lasting 48 hours to seven days, but requiring an intervention prior to that time. And the nice thing with this study is that they included implantable loop recorders so that you would be able to see exactly what the how much AFib uh, these individuals were having. Um, so, so they were randomized, um, you know, in the study to drug versus ablation and the population, I know you can't probably read this because there's small writing, but the average age is relatively young. You know, again, these are early, um, on, uh, uh patients here have, uh, mean age of about 58, and about two-thirds were men. Uh, and there were a good number of comorbidities in the group. Um, this looks at what kind of treatment in, they had in the drug treatment group. 
you can see a variety of different antiarrhythmic agents were used initially and then during follow-up. During follow-up, there may be intolerance to drugs. So, you know, some of those have, you know, lower, fewer patients were on drugs. So the primary outcome, again, just looking at the development of a more persistent arrhythmia, starting with intermittent arrhythmia and then becoming more persistent, you could see that those patients who received ablation had um, a, a lower chance of developing a more persistent arrhythmia than those on uh, antiarrhythmic drug. And this was dramatic, a 75% reduction in progression to more persistent atrial fibrillation. And this just looks at the, you know, the time. It wasn't just you know, 30 seconds of AFib, but the median duration of the persistent episode you know, it was 15.8 days. So it wasn't, you know, there was a significant number of days and the longest episode was 54 days. Um, by definition, you know, we, we usually say seven days for is, is a definition of persistent AFib or in this study also requiring intervention prior to that. Uh, the primary outcome, uh, you could see here, the hazard ratios, the 75% reduction, and then they looked at components of the primary outcome, in, including need for cardioversion of the arrhythmias, uh, a significant reduction there also. Um, if you look at secondary outcomes of any atrial arrhythmia recurrence, you could see here a 51% reduction. Again, this is the hazard ratio uh, uh, is significantly uh, less you know, let significantly uh, free, more free of arrhythmia in, in those who received ablation. Quality of life was also examined. These measures, um, and some of these measures uh, were also um, uh, better with the ablation group. Um, and then looking at the, you know, healthcare utilization. So not, you know, not all of these parameters, but the, in terms of emergency room visits, not significant, but in terms of hospitalizations, again, less likely to have hospitalization in the ablation group than in the antiarrhythmic group. Um, adverse events overall, and this includes a variety of different adverse events li listed here, did also, um, you know, this any safety endpoint, you know, we think of ablation as having an upfront, you know, risk, but overall, if you count all the different risks over time that were significant, um, it actually, you know, uh, panned out that it, it, the, um, uh, antiarrhythmic group had more adverse events. So in conclusion, first line ablation was associated with a significantly lower progression to persistent AFib when compared to initial antiarrhythmic therapy, but how it, this is a relatively young population with few more, more bit comorbidities. Long-term follow-up first line ablation had a significant reduction in arrhythmia recurrence, significantly lower AFib burden and improvements in quality of life and symptoms, as well as lower healthcare utilization with similar rates of adverse events. Um, I'm gonna now briefly go through another study using botulinum toxin that's used for lots of different things, but this is looking at prevention of post-operative AFib in patients undergoing uh, cardiac surgery. So this is just a phase two study, a dose finding study, looking at, we know that post-operative AFib is a significant problem. It results in increased mor morbidity, um, certainly can increase hospital stay. Um, it's, you know, it, it happens in 30 to 60% of patients who have different types of cardiac surgery. We do, you know, place patients on beta blockers and, and there's been limited efficacy and, and you know, guideline uh, directed therapy related to um, amiodarone. So, you know, we don't really know what to do for these patients. We want to, you know, look at other potential therapies. And what this study uh, was looking at is the role of botulinum toxin. It's thought that the autonomic nervous system may influence you know, this occurrence of arrhythmias and particularly parasympathetic sim stimulation, we know that shortens the atrial refractory period, increases dispersion of repolarization, and can increase the chance of having atrial fibrillation. So injecting, um, you know, this drug uh, into the uh, fat, uh, you know, the epicardial fat um, has had some, you know, preliminary suggestion that maybe that might help reduce post-op AFib. So the patients were randomized to two different doses of botulinum toxin uh, versus placebo. Um, and they included patients who were 55 to 90 years old, anyone undergoing open cardiac surgery, including bypass surgery or valve replacement or repair. And, and they had to be in sinus rhythm for the 48 hours prior to surgery. And they wore a patch monitor for 30 days um, and, and then, uh, you know, for seven days after each study visit. 
Um, so uh, the endpoints, the primary endpoint was the percentage of participant, participants with at least one continuous episode of AFib defined, you know, whether you, you know, agree with it or not, you know, in the, in the current consensus, consensus documents and guidelines right now, say 30 seconds of AFib, relatively short duration. Um, overall, you can get an idea of what kind of surgery they had. Um, here, you can see a lot of where bypass surgery alone, some were combined bypass and valve surgery. So overall, if you look at the dosing, uh, so the dosing looking at different durations of AFib, um, the orange one is the 125 unit dose, placebo is here, and then the higher dose is here. You could see that these hazard ratios were really not significant, still crossed you know, uh, uh, here, not quite significant, but if anything, the 125 dose seemed to maybe have suggestion of a response. Again, small study, uh, really not powered to look at the outcome here per se. Um, and then if we look at just those patients who received cabbage, you know, again, still the lower dose may, in orange here, may give a suggestion, an early suggestion of some benefit uh, compared with placebo. Uh, this is looking just at the older patients, 65 or older. Now we are seeing in this subgroup um, that it does look like there is a significant reduction in uh, post-op AFib in the lower dose, not seen in the higher dose. Um, looking at other, you know, other values, length of stay certainly doesn't look any different. Again, maybe a suggestion here that there could be a trend towards uh, a reduction in, in early rehospitalization uh, within 30 days. Um, they also measured, you know, biomarkers uh, in this study. Uh, serious adverse effects. I think the important thing here is that really no difference in any serious adverse effects in placebo compared to the two different doses. So uh, limited, limited a study, again, but it's just a dose ranging study, phase two study for a proof of concept. It's not powered to demonstrate superiority and not powered to you know, look at other cardiovascular outcomes and uh, limited due to sample sizes so that subgroup analyses need to be you know, looked at with a, with a grain of salt here. Uh, so in conclusion, in the phase two study, a dose ranging study, there was no significant differences in the rate of post-op AFib with either of the doses compared to placebo in the overall population, although the subgroup analyses suggest a lower rate of post-op AFib and rehospitalization in those undergoing isolated bypass surgery, particularly in the older patient group. The mechanism of AFib suppression with this drug may be related to both autonomic influences and decreased inflammation. Again, uh, you know, un unclear. Uh, and the last one I'm going to mention is enhance AFib. Uh, this was an, an, an AHA uh, 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 grant funded research uh, for, at five centers across the United States to evaluate um, a, a, a decision making tool. Uh, uh, with um, uh, in in a population of uh, patients and looking at stroke prevention. Right now, we know that stroke prevention uh, use of anticoagulation is underutilized. There's also um, you know the disparities you know related to this and and gaps in care that may impact. Um, certain groups more than others, particularly, you know, based on education level. So uh, that we hypothesized that the shared decision-making tool is more effective than usual care uh, based on patient-selected outcomes. It was designed in both English and, and Spanish, a web-based tool, and it used animation. It was actually a nice little video to teach patients about atrial fibrillation and the role of anticoagulation. And then um, it gives a little quiz you know, to try to educate and, and quiz the patients about what they've learned. Um, so, and, and then there's also, um, um, you know, education about what a blood thinner is. Um, and, it, and so there were two arms to the study using the tool in one arm uh, versus usual care. It was over a thousand patients at five sites. They were included if they had a chads score of one uh, for men or two for women and had non-valvular AFib. Um, and they used this uh, decisional conflict score um, and measured it one month. And you know, the higher score meant more conflict. And um, this was the primary endpoint. And there were also other secondary endpoints related to uh, decision-making and education. Um, this was the sample size, uh, you know, calculation of needing a thousand participants. There was a, a little gap, you know, during COVID, uh, although a lot of this enrollment was able to be performed, you know, remotely in, in this study. 
Uh, so overall analysis was made in the rand that were randomized to the usual care versus intervention, about 500 patients in each group. Um, and this was the primary endpoint, the decisional conflict. And you can see here that there was a, a significant difference. The tool resulted in a better outcome, a significant decrease in decisional conflict at one month. Um, and they measured other things too. Um, uh, prep for decision-making, again, better using the tool um, than with usual care. And also AFib knowledge was better using the tool than with usual care. Um, and this is a graphic re representation of some of those um, measures, the decisional conflict tool at different points in time, you know, in, in early on, even early on post-visit at one month, um, that was significantly different. So in, in short, uh, there was a decision, uh, a decision-making tool was created and designed for low health literacy uh, individuals. And at one month, the shared decision-making intervention resulted in a significant decrease in decisional conflict, improved preparation for decision-making, and increased AFib knowledge. And this is, you know, available, um, you know, is, is published, actually, it was simultaneously published with, with this presentation at American Heart. And you can scan this to um, upload this decision-making tool to use for your patients. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Russo. That was amazing um, summary of what happened at AHA for arrhythmias. There were a lot more, but uh, you, I think you chose such great trials. We're going to move on to Dr. Moran. Um, take it away, Dr. Moran. Thank you so much. Uh, hard to follow Dr. Russo with her wonderful presentation, but I'll take you through a whirlwind on ischemia trials that I included pretty much everything coronary STEMI and ischemia extended. So these are my disclosures. And we're gonna start first and foremost with um, radial artery and, um, and right internal thoracic artery patency after cabbage for 15 years. This is pretty important patients undergoing cabbage and we really wanna use total arterial revascularization. Here they enrolled and randomized 394 patients to a, um, a right internal uh, uh, thoracic artery, free right internal thoracic artery versus radial artery, and 15 years of data. Imagine that. No one lost the follow-up. And what they saw was the MACE reduction actually uh, with the radial artery, which is in line with our guidelines. Radial artery, class 1A recommendation, or uh, 1A to be, and I think it was the level of evidence was not A, was C, but certainly for uh, the, the definitely as the arterial conduit that should be used uh, after the Lima, of course, but uh, total arterial revascularization even better. They also looked at the radial artery compared to saphenous vein graft and what they found also compared to the saphenous vein graft, as you would imagine, 15 years, much, much better. So radial artery, ask your surgeon to use the radial artery. There have been less and less use of it. We need to do that. There was this couple of ER, uh, uh, studies that I wanna go over. This one was an herbal medicine, Chinese herbal medicine versus placebo in a double blind placebo controlled trial, 4,000 patients, unbelievable. Could only happen in, in, STEMI, in, in, in China. 4,000 STEMI patients, really double blind placebo controlled. They didn't lose a single patient. But take a look at these reductions at 30 days. Almost too good to be true, honestly, with this. I don't know what's in there, but uh, it certainly is, um, is very, very effective in reducing that primary endpoint, reducing all-cause death, MI, coronary revascularization, and stroke within 30 days to the tunes of about 36% and even a reduction of 30% of cardiac death, 56 deaths versus 80 in placebo. And of course, reinfarction was also in favor of this Chinese herbal medicine. Obviously, we need to better understand what's in there, but also uh, there is some heritin um, uh, analog in there from some of the, uh, I think, venoms and things that they put in there, but it may very well be an anticoagulant and other kind of activities. Right for re-examined bivalirudin, the, the drug that's been now downgraded to a 2B recommendation compared to heparin. This is for primary PCI. Another study from China, 6,000 randomized patients to bival versus heparin. Here, 
after they gave the bivalorudin, they continued it, not just the bolus and a drip, but the drip continued for two to four hours after. This was one of the things that they did different than the Horizons AMI study where there was more stent thrombosis in bivalorudin. Here, they kept the bivalorudin going compared to heparin. And lo and behold, they all caused mortality and type three to five bleeds were significantly lower with the numbers needed to treat of only 76. So a reduction in mortality and high level bleeds I don't know if this is going to rethink the idea about uh, maybe upgrading it to a 2A, but certainly is uh, for STEMI patients is something that we see that probably needs to be repeated, but obviously very important. The other one is this idea that can we switch out aspirin? I guess, you know, I said drop aspirin in Twilight here. They say, what about indo indobufen uh, and versus aspirin after coronary artery? Stenting. So this was another pretty nice, large, randomized uh, trial. 103 centers, again, in China. Um, uh, patients were uh, uh, randomized to aspirin clopidogrel. We would use aspirin ticagrelor or aspirin prasigrel, but here it's aspirin clopidogrel versus indo indobufen and clopidogrel. And then they followed these patients for these endpoints you see listed up here, mace and bleeding. And overall, non, in, indobufen was non-inferior to aspirin at one year, no differences. So actually they met the non-inferiority and in fact that this could be an option. Honestly, I think no option is better just dropping an aspirin after a period of, um, a short period of dual antiplatelet therapy with a potent agent. Um, the next one was precise. This was also a little bit of a precision strategy versus usual testing with patients who come in with non-acute chest pain, uh, requiring testing for suspected CAD. 2,100 patients, they use this uh, promise minimal risk score. And then of course, they use the precision um, testing assigned by promise versus just modality sex, uh, uh, selection by the site. And what they did is they looked at the primary endpoint of death, non-fatal MI, cats with or without um, obstructive coronary disease. This was presented by Pam Douglas. And sure enough, precision strategy was better in reducing these important outcomes. The proportion of patients with an event was lower in those patients. And of course, uh, we're using the precision strategy, much better uh, outcome compared to just the usual care. The long-awaited um, data from long-term follow-up ex of ex ischemia extent. Everyone remembers chronic coronary syndromes, initial in uh, invasive versus a conservative strategy of treating patients with stable coronary disease, 5,100 and more patients enrolled. And as you all remember that at 3.2 years, two years ago when the AHA presentation took place by Judy Hockman, there was no evidence of any difference in mortality. They extended the follow-up out to six years. As you remember, the curves were separating, not for mortality, but for myocardial infarction in favor of invasive strategy. So there was this big question, could there be an important outcome on death? And guess what? There isn't no difference at all. All-cause mortality is exactly the same. Uh, literally, the lines are hugging each other and there's no change at all. In the invasive strategy, though, there was less cardiovascular death, but there was more non-cardiovascular death. So um, at the end of the day, overall mortality is similar. Last but not least, ischemia in the legs, critical limb ischemia. Uh, and this was the very important long-awaited trial, best endovascular versus best surgical therapy for patients with uh, chronic limb-threatening ischemia, or what we call critical limb ischemia, but ser seriously, these patients had infralinguinal PAD corroborated by hemodynamic um, uh, criteria, not at an excessive risk for surgery, eligible for open and endo, randomized with two different stratifications. One was a, uh, if there was an adequate um, saphenous vein graft for surgical revascularization, or the second cohort was the alternative conduit, both were um, basically randomized to endovascular versus surgical. And the initial 
Obviously, as you could see, sorry, this is, I went backwards. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And what you see here is that in the best um, uh, for major adverse limb events, which is major reintervention above ankle amputation, this is serious amputation or all cause mortality in cohort one, it looks like you have a better outcome with surgery. And that was a longer period of time at 2.7 years. As you see past 2.7 years, the numbers at risk become so low. You shouldn't even look at that, but really it looks like the uh, uh, surgical revasque looks better and no difference with cohort two when there is uh, alternative, uh, alternative conduits. And with that, I'm done with all of the ischemia trials for you guys. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Moran. A wonderful summary of all those trials. Um, we're gonna move on to Dr. Khan, who is going to present the heart failure trials. Thank you so much. So today I'll be talking about the major heart failure clinical trials presented at AHA 2022. The first trial that I'll be talking about is the Transform HF trial. The Transform HF trial was a pragmatic randomized controlled trial, uh, which included patients with HEF-REF or HEF-PEF with elevated pro-BNP. The patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to torsamide versus furosemide. The primary endpoint was all-cause mortality, which was assessed through National Death Index or DCRI call center. It's important to note the pragmatic design of Transform HF trial, which replaced all traditional in-person study specific follow-up visits with phone interviews. These are the baseline characteristics of the patients enrolled in the Transform HF trial. The, the two groups were pretty well balanced. Almost 60% of the patients uh, had HEF-REF and almost 30% of the patients had newly diagnosed heart failure. 8% of the patients were on, were on STL2 inhibitor at baseline, and less than 50% of the patients were on MRA at baseline. The primary endpoint of all-cause mortality was not significantly different between the torsamide group versus the furosemide group with a hazards ratio of 1.02 and a p-value of 0.77. These results were consistent across all pre-specified subgroups, including age, gender, race, and ejection fraction. For the endpoint of all-cause mortality or hospitalizations, although the event rates were slightly lower in the torsamide group versus the furosemide group, the results were still not statistically significant different with a hazards ratio of 0.92 and a p-value of 0.11. So in conclusion, we could say that there was similar efficacy of torsamide versus furosemide for all-cause mortality or total hospitalizations. The trial did not address decongestion or disease-specific outcomes. It is also important to note that the pragmatic trials are important for simplicity, cost-effectiveness, and reflection of real-life setting. The next trial that we'll be talking about is the STRONG HF trial. Uh, which included patients with acute heart failure who are ready to be discharged and were not on, sub, uh, were not on optimal doses of GDMT and had a pre-discharge NT pro BNP of more than 1500. These patients were randomized to high intensity care versus usual care in a one to one fashion. The usual care was defined as follow-up and therapy adjustments per physician's usual practice while the high intensity care was defined as starting half optimal uh, doses of GDMT prior to hospital discharge with a follow-up one week safety visit, and then subsequently uh, transferring all patients to full optimal doses of GDMT at week two, and then to more safety follow-up visits at week three and week six. The primary endpoint was 180 day all-cause mortality or heart failure admissions. So for the primary endpoint of one day, 180 day heart failure readmissions or death, there was significantly lower events in the high intensity care group versus the usual care group with a risk difference of 7.3% and a p-value of 0.0034. When only all-cause mortality through 180 day was assessed there was no significant difference between the high intensity care group 
versus the usual care group with a risk difference of 1.9% and a p-value of 0.30. Sorry for that. So in terms of safety, there was no increase in safety adverse events at day 90 in the high intensity care group versus the usual care group. However, there was a slight increase in any adverse event rate in the high intensity care group versus the usual care group. So in conclusion, we could say that an intensive treatment strategy of rapid up titration of GDMT and close follow-up after heart failure admission reduced symptoms improved quality of life and reduced the risk of 180-day all-cause death or heart failure readmission compared with usual care. This trial provides direct clinical trial evidence for simultaneous rapid sequence initi initiation and titration of GDMT in heart failure with close follow-up. The next trial that I'll be talking about is the Ironman trial. Ironman was a prospective randomized open-label blinded endpoint trial done at 70 hospitals in the UK. Patients aged 18 years or older with HEFREF and transfer and saturation less than 20% or serum ferritin less than 100 were included. Patients were randomly assigned to intravenous ferric derisomaltose or usual care. The primary outcome was recurrent hospital admissions for heart failure and cardiovascular death. Importantly, a COVID-19 sensitivity analysis censoring follow-up on September 30th, 2020 was pre-specified. 1,137 patients were randomly assigned to receive intravenous ferric derisomaltose or usual care for the primary endpoint of all hospital admissions for heart failure and cardiovascular death. The event rates were lower in the IV iron group compared with the usual care group. However, the results did not meet statistically significant difference with a risk ratio of 0.82 and a p-value of 0.07. Similar trends were also seen in other cardiovascular endpoints as well. Importantly, in the COVID-19 pre-specified analysis, there were 210 primary endpoints which occurred in the IV iron group compared with 280 events in the usual care group, making the results significantly different with a risk ratio of 0.76 and a p-value of 0.047. It is important to know that the Ironman trial was unique compared to the previous IV iron trials because it had a longer follow-up, follow-up of more than one year, and it also used repeated doses of IV iron, making the trial ideal to assess safety outcomes. There was no significant difference in hospitalizations due to infection or death due to infection in the IV iron group compared with the usual care. So in conclusion, we could say that although the results were not statistically significant, the results were indeed directionally favorable on all key cardiovascular outcomes with IV ferric derexomaltose. However, the results may have been affected by COVID-19 pandemic. It is also important to note that the similar results were seen in a firm EHF trial, which used a different formulation of IV iron. Although neither Affirm HF nor Ironman met their primary endpoints, their COVID-19 specificity analysis were significantly positive, and the totality of evidence does suggest that administration of IV iron does reduce hospital admissions for heart failure, although uncertainty persists about a reduction in cardiovascular mortality. The next trial that I'll be talking about is the COACH trial, which tested whether the use of a strategy to support clinicians in making decisions about discharging or admitting patients coupled with rapid follow-up would affect outcomes. This trial was a stepped wedge cluster randomized trial done in 10 hospitals in Canada. The randomization was done at a hospital level. The intervention included a point of care algorithm to stratify patients with heart failure according to risk of death. Low risk patients were discharged early, and patients who were discharged early were given access to standardized transitional care heart failure clinic. The core primary outcomes were composite of all cause death or cardiovascular hospitalizations within 30 days and a composite outcome within 20 months. So, for the analysis of the primary outcome within 30 days, the results were significantly different in the favor of the intervention group compared with the control group with a hazards ratio of 0.88 and a p-value of 
Similar results were also seen when the primary outcome was analyzed within 20 months with a hazards ratio of 0.95. So in conclusion, we could say that the use of a hospital-based strategy to support clinical decision-making and rapid follow-up led to a 12% lower risk of the composite of all-cause death or hospitalization for cardiovascular causes within 30 days from usual care. Implementation of such an approach across healthcare systems may provide for early and safe discharge plus improved outcomes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Khan. Excellent um, summary of the heart failure trials. Lots of questions and um, for you later, but um, we're going to present. We're going to uh, go on to Dr. Hayes, who will present us um, the imaging trials at AHA. Great, thank you. Thanks for the invitation, and that, that was an excellent pre presentation. So I was just going to go over some key cardiovascular imaging trials. These are smaller scale trials than you've heard in with the prior presenters, but um, just trials, I think, um, translating novel imaging techniques into clinical practice to answer interesting clinical questions. Um, so the first was from a group in Japan, and part of the premise of the study is looking at other factors that can predict cardiovascular events and coronary disease um, outside of luminal stenosis. And because inflammation is strongly associated to the development of coronary disease, they looked on CT at pericoronary adipose tissue, which is thought to communicate directly um, with um, the va uh, vascular endothelium and insight coronary atherosclerosis. So there's, there's a lot of interest and clinical application in this area. And so um, the authors asked the question if the degree of pericoronary adipose tissue on CT can predict cardiovascular events. And they chose to focus on a very important patient population, which is patients with non obstructive coronary artery disease. So let me advance the next slide. So some of the background is that recent studies have shown that CT can visualize and quantify pericoronary fat accumulation called PCAT, and high PCAT indicates an increased inflammation surrounding the arteries that's thought to communicate um, with the underlying lumen. And one of their objectives was to see if this was a useful and incremental predictor for coronary events in patients with non-obstructive CAD. So in terms of methods, they screened um, patients with suspected stable, stable coronary artery disease. Um, they looked at those who had a history of CAD compared to those who had um, a history of obstructive CAD in the past on CCTA. And then they screened out those with non-obstructive CAD on CCTA. Um, their final study population was uh, 1,183 patients. Um, and they examined um, Hounsfield units um, using specialized software, um, looking at the proximal 40 um, millimeters of segments of all the major coronary arteries, so the LAD circumflex and RCA. And the outcome that they were looking at was a composite of MACE or cardiovascular events, including cardiovascular death, acute coronary syndrome, as well as late coronary revascularization. And so they followed patients for a median follow-up of close to two years. There were a total of 32 cardiovascular events, into, including four deaths, 13 acute coronary syndrome events, as well as 15 late coronary revascularizations. And you can see the table one here. In terms of their findings, they quantified PCAT or paracoronary adipose tissue um, and looked at the LAD, RCA, and circumflex. And they found that those who had increased uh, PCAT had greater events than those who didn't, but this was primarily focused in the LAD, but not in the RCA or the circumflex. So that was interesting. And then they used a multivariable logistic regression model, model to look and adjust for traditional cardiovascular risk factors, including basic demographics, as well as traditional risk factors such as diabetes and smoking. They also looked at more traditional analyses such as luminal stenosis, calcium score, and other factors on CT. And they found that although several of these factors, including um, coronary art artery calcium score was predictive on univariate analysis. The only two factors on multivariate analysis after adjusting for risk factors included high risk plaque stenosis as well as PCAT on the LAD. So after adding this to the model, they found 
that the quantification of CCTA paracoronary adipose tissue increased um, the predictive value significantly above and beyond traditional coronary risk factors. So in conclusion, they found that those with high PCAT levels, um, pericoronary adipose tissue on CT surrounding the LAD had incremental prognostic value over conventional risk factors in patients who presented without obstructive CAD. And the significance of the findings is that this may be um, another novel imaging technique that may be worth measuring in patients with, without obstructive CAD to be able to risk stratify them better in the future. Um, I also wanted to talk about a second um, imaging study, which focused on CMR techniques, and they really wanted to um, quantify tissue characterization. This is a group in Brazil to distinguish pathological from physiologic hypertrophy, which is a common clinical question. And so the groups that they chose to study were athletes. Um, with potential physiologic hypertrophy, healthy controls without hypertrophy, compared to HEPPEP patients with known LVH, um, with LVEF at least 45%, as well as HEFREF. And their protocol was that each patient underwent a CMR as well as full echo exam. They also looked at physiologic measures um, of reduced exercise capacity using metabolic stress testing, and they also sampled blood for biomarkers. And so these are the techniques that they use. They perform T1 mapping. Um, they gave gadolinium pre and post for extracellular volume matrix quantification as well. And so these, these are the main results, which is nicely summarized in this table. So they found um, that in control um, individuals who had normal EFs, um, they basically had no LVH and no abnormalities in any of the tissue characterization techniques. Primary, the, primarily the ones of interest were native T1, which reflects um, fibrosis, um, extracellular volume as well, and LGE. So these were completely normal as expected in controls. Um, in athlete's heart, they determined there was physiologic hypertrophy, which was primarily eccentric, um, with um, no change in ECV, a slight decrease in T1 of unclear significance, um, but there is no um, significant um, disruption to LVF or subclinical myocardial dysfunction, there was an increase in LV mass index. So there's physiologic hypertrophy. However, in those with HEFPEF, they um, quantify this as pathologic hypertrophy, which was mainly concentric LVH that was accompanied by abnormal tissue characterization. Primarily, this was reflected by an increase in T1 values, which indicates diffuse fibrosis, um, increase in ECV values, which could um, indicate diffuse inflammation. Um, and this was in contrast to HEFREF, in which the EF, of course, was less than 40%, higher LV mass index, and primarily eccentric pathologic hypertrophy. And then they related this nicely um, in the groups to um, cardiac exercise capacity, as well as peak VO2 on CPAT. So they showed that the higher the native T1 that they were seeing in HEFPEF patients, for instance, was related to reduced peak VO2, so a nice physiologic measure. They also showed that elevated extracellular volume fraction, which is calculated from T1 post-gadolinium and T1 uh, before gadolinium, native T1, um, as that increases, there's also reduction in peak VO2. So in conclusion, this was a multi-parametric tissue characterization study using CMR that helped to differentiate physiologic from pathologic cardiac hypertrophy, which is often a question in athletes, in um, HCM, and other pathological entities such as HEFPEF. And so they found that athletes primarily presented with physiologic hypertrophy, which was eccentric as opposed to concentric, um, with normal ECV. Whereas those with HEFPEF, for instance, presented with pathologic hypertrophy with increased native T1 and ECV. So these are the distinguishing factors that we're able to um, distinguish between these two entities compared to normal. So I wanted to just highlight a, um, two other quick studies. These were smaller studies, which were posters. And I also wanted to feature an echo study. So this study really looked at um, global longitudinal strain um, and used 3D, 3D techniques, which are novel. So the standard is using 2D speckle tracking techniques to measure global longitudinal strain, which has some inherent limit, limitations, with, which relate to image acquisition and image quality. So they compared 2D techniques with 3 
3D speckle tracking techniques. And so their population of interest were patients who underwent heart transplant. And each patient had a full echo study, including full 3D and full 2D. They compared this and used um, both of the outcomes in terms of global longitudinal strain with the two techniques to predict MACE, as well as all-cause mortality. So you can see the 2D techniques are here on the left um, in the right in the right sided panel, and the 3D techniques are in the right. And they concluded that in their large cohort of heart transplant recipients, the study demonstrated that 3D, both 3D and 2D GLS predicted MACE. However, um, they thought that 3D was slightly more powerful in predicting MACE compared to 2D techniques. So this suggests that and supports um, the conclusion that 3D GLS may identify higher risk patients who um, underwent heart transplant. So in, in our institution, we're often acquiring um, strain imaging techniques post-transplant as well when they come to get biopsies or dibutamine stress echoes. So it could be a, a useful adjunct to predict events. And so I was going to present one more study, but in the interest of time, I'm just going to go to the conclusion of the take-home points of the prior studies that I mentioned. So number one, pericoronary adipose tissue um, measured on CT can predict cardiovascular events and non-obstructive CAD. Number two, CMR tissue characterization techniques can help differentiate athlete's heart from half pef and controls um, with physiologic hypertrophy and different patterns of eccentricity. And three, on the ECHO study that I presented, 3D GLS was more predictive than 2D GLS for predicting MACE in post-cardiac transplant patients. And then I didn't get to go into women with INOCA or um, ischemia with non-obstructive coronary arteries, but there is an additional study that used AI techniques to quantify plaque burden on CCTA and found that high-risk features as well as total plaque bur burden quantified using AI techniques was associated with more frequent angina. So thank you for the invitation, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions later. Thank you so much, Alison. Uh, so um, I have the pleasure uh, to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Romain Boulestro, which is um, our uh, French Society of Cardiology specialist in hypertension. Thank you so much, Romain, for your time. Uh, you have the, the microphone, uh, if I can say so, for um, all the hypertension trials that were, um, that were important to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandru. Can you confirm you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, both of you, for the invitation and all the speakers with the incredible talk. Um, I will speak about hypertension trial. And I'm deeply happy because we have, we have lots of new uh, therapeutic class and pathway, and that's not so frequent in hypertension. So let's move quickly to the first trial, which was um, trying Firibasta in resistant hypertension. Uh, it's a French molecule, it's a French story. Um, you probably all know uh, renin angiotensin system, angiotensin 1 and 2, but few of us know angiotensin 3 and 4, which are in the brain, only in the brain. And this little uh, molecule was trying to inhibit um, this brain angiotensin system. Um, we had few uh, preliminary data which were um, good. But unfortunately, in EHE uh, 2022, uh, we knew that uh, in a resistant hypertension, this molecule wasn't effective to lower blood pressure. So let's move on quickly to another molecule, Brax draw stat, uh, which was uh, which was trying resistant hypertension as well. Uh, and this is a small molecule to inhibit aldosterone synthesis. You may all know that primary aldosteronism is the most frequent secondary hypertension. Uh, it might be 20% of resistant hypertensive patients, so really, really frequent. And the cardiovascular burden is really high because even if you have the same blood pressure level, uh, if you have primary aldosteronism without specific treatment, you will have much more uh, MACE uh, than uh, if you have only essential hypertension. Uh, we all know the treatment, it's uh, spironolactone, which, is, uh, which blocks the receptors, but we have frequent side effects, which limitates the use of this treatment. So um, Bactrostat uh, is a new treatment which inhibits only aldosterone, which is quite incredible because cortisol is almost the same molecule, as you may know, 
but it's very specific. Uh, we have the nice trial with four groups, uh, three months treatment, double blind, uh, really a rigorous treatment. And what we, can, what we can see, we can see that this patient had a good treatment. All of them had diuretic. Um, most of them had uh, RAS inhibitors and uh, canal calcium channel blockers. So it was really resistant hypertension, hypertensive patient. And on top of that, they used uh, backstrostat uh, with different dosages um, and uh, placebo. And here are the results. You, you can see that backstrostat with two milligrams lower blood pressure uh, with 20 uh, millimeter of mercury of systolic blood pressure, which, which is quite incredible. You can see that uh, urinary aldosterone um, is lowered and the aldosterone level is lowered, so uh, the treatment do, does work. What is important with this treatment is safety profile. And as you can see, even with the highest dose, uh, you have only few, really few uh, problems with uh, potassium, which is the main problem of uh, spironolactam. And you have no uh, gynecomastia. So the conclusion is that this new treatment uh, does work to lower blood pressure uh, with few side effects, and it's really uh, a, a nice molecule to, to look uh, in the future. Uh, last treatment, last uh, new pathway, which was really incredible in uh, this uh, AHA 2022, um, endotelin antagonist. You all know that for um, pulmonary hypertension, but we have been waiting for this molecule in hypertension, arterial hypertension, for a long time now. It's a dual antagonist uh, because endothelin 1 can uh, work on two receptors, A and B, and do lots of bad uh, stuff on cardiovascular system in our patients. It was a really interesting trial uh, with lots of uh, different parts. In part 1, as you can see, uh, every patient had a fixed combination of uh, canal channel, uh, calcium channel blockers, uh, valsartan, which is um, uh, RAS inhibitor, and diuretic. All of them, um, including placebo group, uh, as you can see, had a high um, drop on blood pressure, which is one of the main uh, interesting findings in this trial. Then, you may see that aprocitantan with the highest uh, dose, uh, lower blood pressure, more than placebo uh, in this first part. In the second part, all the patient had aprocitantan full dose. And you can see that the blood pressure lowering effect lasts for at least, um, at least uh, 48 weeks. And then another part with double blind um, randomization and half of the patient had a placebo uh, instead of uh, aprocitantan full dose. And you can see that if you stop aprocitantan, uh, the blood pressure level uh, goes high again. So uh, through efficacy, as expected with this treatment, um, a high uh, percentage of um, lower limb edema, uh, almost 15%, which is quite high, but was easy to manage with diuretics. So in conclusion, uh, we have another nice uh, treatment, uh, which in a resistant hypertension can be used to lower blood pressure. It lasts in the time with quite frequent uh, side effects, but easy to manage. Uh, and maybe it could be an attractive alternative, especially to uh, better protect our patients. So in conclusion, we had lots of new trials on new molecules, which is a good news for hypertensive patients. Blood pressure pipeline is not dry, and we speak a lot about renal innovation, but we have also new treatments. Uh, it's opened new leads for difficult to treat hypertensive patients, but we do not have to forget the basics. Secure blood pressure measurement with IBPM, uh, full blood pressure treatment with the three uh, standard Molecule which are uh, calcium channel blocker, race inhibitors, and diuretics. Uh, if we can do that in combined piles, uh, just like we just see, um, and um, and then we can use a new treatment in the resistant hypertension if we need to do that. But don't forget that spironolactone is also really uh, efficient. Uh, 
So that's all for hypertension. Thanks a lot for everyone and see you next year. Thank you, Dr. Bolestro. That was excellent. Um, and uh, I'm so glad to hear there are more new antihypertensive drugs coming along because we need them. So I just want to summarize what some of the things we learned today. Some herb, Chinese herbal medicines can decrease outcomes in STEMI patients, which is quite exciting. We have to figure out what, what is in that medication, um, in that herb. Um, we also learned that uh, pericoronary um, fat tissue, especially in the LAD, can predict outcomes. And that's another interesting imaging um, trial that was presented. And then um, iron infusions can actually decrease hospitalization. So we'll have to learn about the mechanism of that. I'd love to talk to Mohammed about that. Um, and then of course, catheter ablations always win. <laughs> so I'm gonna let you, Dr. Mushi, um, can make the conclusion. Thank you so much, Annabelle. Uh, thank you once again to all the speakers, brilliant speakers, and uh, the trials were exceptional. This is this is one of the reasons because uh, for, for which we will not go into details uh, for the moment, or we will not have any discussion because there are so many beautiful trials with so many uh, messages and uh, um, so many learnings uh, that it is too much. It should uh, we, we should block an entire day to discuss that. So um, thank you so much. First of all, thank you, uh, Annabelle, um, Professor Volgman. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. We will end this session um, now. This is a recorded session, which will be broadcasted tomorrow. Um, and. Uh, uh, I hope uh, our audience will like it, uh, and I'm sure they will. Thank you once again for participating, and have a nice evening or have a nice day, because it's um, it's midday in uh, in the U.S. Thank you, Dr. Mishi. Excellent organization once again. Thank you. Thank you.